So uh, Laura Suarez is a PhD candidate in the neuroscience program at McGill University. Her background is in engineering and her main interests lie at the intersection of artificial intelligence and neuroscience. Broadly speaking, her research revolves around the link between structure and function in biological brains. Specifically, she wants to understand how network structure and dynamics interact to shape the computational capacity of biological neural networks and how we can use this knowledge to establish novel design principles for the development of better neuromorphic architectures. Her work is currently supervised by Dr. Bratislav Misic from the Montreal Neurological Institute and by Dr. Guillaume Lajoie from the Montreal Institute for Learning Algorithms. Uh, so without further ado, and also, if anybody has any questions, you can just type them into the chat uh, or raise your hand. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction, Nadia. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, OK, um, the presentation, you can see the presentation. Good. Yeah. OK, so. So yeah, um, I'm Laura Suarez, um, and I work uh, with Dr. Bratislav Misic at the Montreal Neurological Institute, and this is a working collaboration with uh, Blake Richards and Guillaume Lajoie. And the title of the project is Learning Function from a Structure in Neuromorphic Networks. So let's start. So we can think of the brain as a network of functionally specialized brain regions that are physically interconnected by anatomical links. And we refer to this network of anatomical connections as the structural network of the brain. Now, this structural network um, forms the scaffold on which information propagates throughout the brain, and therefore it plays an important role in shaping how neural dynamics unfold over time. Now, functionally specialized brain regions not only um, interact physically, but also functionally through coherent dynamics. And we uh, capture those functional interactions via what we call functional connectivity networks. Now, the co-activation patterns that emerge from those functional interactions are thought to be the neural processes that support human cognition and behavior. However, how um, these three elements of structure, dynamics, and function interact to support the computations that underlie human cognition and behavior still remains one of the biggest uh, questions in neuroscience. Um, and this work represents like baby steps um, in that direction. Okay, so why does it even make sense in the first place to study the, the network structure of the brain? And the reason is because several uh, descriptive studies about the human connectome have shown that um, it possesses several non-trivial topological features that are characteristics, uh, characteristic of complex systems. Uh, so, for instance, the human connectome possesses a small world architecture, which is characterized by a high local clustering coefficient and a low characteristic path length, meaning that the average uh, topological shortest path between brain regions is very low. Other works have shown that the human connectome have, uh, has a hierarchical modular structure. Also, if we look at the node degree uh, distribution of uh, in the human connectome, we can see that it is a heavy tail degree distribution, meaning that there are a few number of nodes with a disproportionate, disproportionately high number of connections. And we know these, uh, we call these highly connected nodes uh, the hops of the brain. And there are other studies that have shown that these uh, hops are highly interconnected with each other, forming what we know as the Rich Club organization. Um, of, the, of the brain, and it seems to play an important role in global communication dynamics. Now, despite these insights about the topological features of the human connectome, it is still not clear how specific topological features support specific computations and therefore uh, specific cognitive functions. Now, traditionally in neuroscience, the way in which the link between a structure and function has been addressed is through models that map structural connectivity to functional connectivity. And in this regard, different types of models have been proposed, but they can be mainly categorized in three families, which are statistical models, communication models, and biophysical models. I won't go into details about uh, these models. I just want to mention that they have been very successful in, in explaining how the network structure of the brain supports emerging neural dynamics and functional connectivity patterns 
However, these models fail to establish a link between these emergent functional interactions and the computations that underlie cognition and behavior. So again, uh, with this work or with this project, we are addressing the link between a structure and function, but with a focus on computation. That is, function not understood as functional connectivity, but more um, uh, from as a computational property. So specifically, what we did is we combined MRI connectomics and reservoir computing, which are two concepts that I, ex that I will explain in the next uh, slides, to investigate the link between macroscale connectivity and the computational properties that emerge from network dynamics in the human connectome. So by, by MRI connectomics, we refer to the process of reconstructing the human connectome using uh, MRI data. So for this, we, um, we put the subjects in these MRI scanners, and then from that, we obtain these 3D or 4D diffusion-weighted MRI um, data. Now, the first step in the reconstruction of the connectome is the definition of the nodes of the network. So for that, we use a predefined anatomical parcellation known as the desikan kiliani atlas. We use the highest resolution, which consists of 1,000 cortical regions and 15 subcortical regions. Now, the next step is the definition of the edges of the network. So uh, for that, we apply a deterministic streamline tractography on the diffusion-weighted MRI data. And what this algorithm does is that it traces the white matter tracks between brain regions. So uh, using these processes, we reconstructed individual structural connectivity networks. Now, the tractography algorithm is prone to false positives and false negatives. So in order to reduce the impact of those, um, it is very common to use a group consensus approach. So that's what we did. We reconstruct a group level structural connectivity network using individual networks. But because we wanted a distribution for our estimates, we use a bootstrap resampling approach in which we resample different populations from the original one. And then we, we built 1,000 different group consensus connectivity networks. Um, and those are the ones that we use for our analysis. Now, what is reservoir computing? So in a very broad sense, reservoir computing is this idea of um, using dynamical systems to perform uh, computations. So as long as the reservoir or the dynamical system has sufficient built-in complexity, it is capable of producing um, a large variety of input-output mappings, including the approximation of very complex functions. Now, in its simplest form, the reservoir computing architecture consists of an input layer. Then we have the hidden layer, which is known as the reservoir, and is typically a recurrent neural network of nonlinear units. And then we have the readout module or readout unit, which is typically a linear model. Now, in contrast to traditional uh, recurrent artificial neural networks, in the reservoir computing approach, we do not train the recurrent connections within the, the reservoir. The only connections that are trained are the ones that go from the reservoir to the readout unit, which correspond to the coefficients of the linear model. Now, you might be wondering, OK, if we do not train, if these connections are, are fixed, how does reservoir computing work? And the idea is that we have an input signal, a time varying input signal. We introduce that signal into the reservoir. And because this reservoir is highly nonlinear and it's a um, high dimensional system, it performs a nonlinear projection of the input signal into this space of higher dimensions. And that transformation of the input signal is supposed to transform linearly, um, sorry, nonlinearly separable problems into linearly separable ones, such that at the end, we can use a simple, simple linear model to perform um, different types of computations on the time varying um, inputs. These are just, this is just the equation that governs the activation states of the nonlinear units within the reservoir, and this is the general form of, of a linear model. So uh, as you might imagine, uh, what we did is we took the human connectome and we used it to constrain the connections within the reservoir. And then we used this connectome informed reservoir to perform a memory task. 
So in this memory task, we have a uniformly distributed random uh, input signal. We introduce that signal into the reservoir through a set of input nodes. Then that signal propagates through the network. And then we're going to read the activation, the time series of the activation states of a set of uh, output nodes. And we're going to use those activation states, or also called reservoir states, to train the linear model to reproduce a delay version of the input signal. So our input signal is u of t, and the target signal is u of t minus tau, where tau represents um, the delay of the signal. Now, in this task, what we are doing is we're measuring the, cap the, the ability of the network to maintain in its current activation state information about past inputs. So we did this, uh, we trained different linear models for different values of the delay. So for different, for, so for each value of the delay, we can obtain a correlation of the, um, of the input and the target signal. And in order to provide a single estimate for the memory capacity of the system, what we did is that we summed the correlation across delays. And that's what we call memory capacity. Now, because we were interested in seeing the effect of network dynamics on the performance of the human connectome, we use this parameter alpha to scale the coupling strength of the connectivity matrix. And by varying alpha, we can transition the dynamics from stable to chaotic. Um, and then uh, for different values of alpha, we perform the exact same procedure in such a way that at the end, we end up with a performance curve of memory capacity as a function of alpha. Now, um, so alpha values that are lower than one correspond to stable dynamics. Alpha values that are greater than one correspond to chaotic dynamics. And alpha values that are very, very close to one correspond to the critical point, which is that transition between um, stability and, and chaos. Now, this um, framework uh, needs the, um, uh, we need to select a set of input nodes and a set of output nodes. So for the input nodes, we use subcortical regions. And for the output nodes, we use the concept of intrinsic networks. So intrinsic networks, which are also known as resting state networks, are a functional connectivity-based partition of the cortex into brain areas that co-activate with each other during rest and during tasks sometimes. And they also tend to share a common function. So for this work, we use the seven network partition proposed by Thomas Yu. And the idea is that these intrinsic networks are thought to be the large scale functional systems of the brain. So they represent like a meaningful and convenient way to divide the cortex into functional modules. So we use these intrinsic networks to define different sets of output nodes for our memory task. So using these intrinsic networks, we perform the memory tasks. So for each of them, we have a performance curve of memory capacity as a function of alpha. And this is just a sanity check because we know from dynamical systems theory that stable dynamics tend to enhance the memory capacity of the system. And as dynamics transition to chaos, um, the memory capacity tends to decay. So the first thing that we did was to, um, to see the, the memory capacity of the human connectome as a whole. So for that, we average uh, across intrinsic networks. And what you're seeing here is the distribution of memory capacity across the 1,000 group consensus networks. Now, we next ask two questions. The first one is whether the memory capacity of the human connectome depends on the underlying network topology. So for that, we compare the human connectome against a family of reward nodes. And the way in which we build these reward networks was by swapping pairs of edges. But we did that in such a way that we preserved the node degree sequence of the network. We're also preserving the size of the network and the connection density of the network. Now, the second question that we ask is whether the partition of the human connectome into these seven intrinsic networks is functionally meaningful, meaning does it provide any computational advantage? So for that, to test that, we compare the human, we use a, um, a spatially constrained label permutation model in which we randomly permuted the intrinsic network labels of the nodes, but we do 
we did that in such a way that we preserve their spatial autocorrelation. So we use these two families of nulls, we perform the same memory task, and then we compare it against the human connectome. So the important observation here is that the human connectome outperforms these, family, these, um, these two new models um, at the critical point, uh, exclusively at the critical point. So in other words, the, the computational advantages granted by the unique topological features of the human connectome, as well as by its uh, modular organization, are optimizing the context of critical dynamics. And this result is interesting because it supports, uh, they support this idea that the human connectome uh, operates at a critical point. So to recapitulate, so the fact that the human connectome outperforms a family of reward nodes suggests that optimal performance at criticality is supported by the unique topological features of the human connectome. The fact that the human connectome outperforms uh, the label permutation model suggests that the modular organization of the, of the brain as defined by these intrinsic networks constitutes a computationally relevant feature of the human connectome. And to synthesize these two, uh, we could say that the interaction between macroscale network topology, mesoscale modular organization, and critical dynamics confers optimal memory capacity to the human connectome. So as I mentioned before, from a computational point of view, these results are interesting because it's, uh, they support this idea that the human brain operates at a, at a critical point. And if you're interested in this topic, there is this very, um, cool review led by Michael Brexpier um, about criticality in the brain. And there is a section in which they uh, explain what would be the computational advantages in terms of information processing um, of, the, of, of critical dynamics. OK, so um, going forward to the next section. So here, so before I show you that the human connectome um, outperforms the, the family of reward nulls exclusively at the critical point. However, uh, and, and then for the rest of the, for the two other dynamical regimes, the reward networks seem to perform better than, than the human connectum. However, this reward null model does not take into account the fact that the human brain is a spatially embedded network, and therefore it does not take into account its geometrical constraints. Now, if we're, when, when it comes to ev evaluating the performance of the human connectome, we should, not, we should not only look at the computational performance, but also um, its um, efficiency in terms of energy consumption. We know that the human brain is a biological system and there are several physical demands that it must satisfy in the presence of um, limited material and metabolic resources. And one of those uh, demands is the, the growth and the maintenance of axonal projections, which entails uh, metabolic and energetic costs that increase with the, um, with the length of the interregional connections. So if we look at the distribution of the connection length in the human connectome, this translates into a prevalence of short range connections. And if we compare that to the connection length distribution of the reward networks, we can see that that distribution shifts towards the right, meaning that there is a larger proportion of long range connections. And this larger proportion of long range connection uh, translates into higher costs uh, due to wiring. So if we um, normalize our memory capacity estimates per wiring cost unit, we can actually see that the human connectome outperforms this family of reward nulls across all dynamical regimes. And these results uh, support this idea that the human brain is an economical network um, that tries to maximize uh, computational capacity while minimizing um, wiring costs. Okay, so in the previous slides, we saw that the human connectome um, performs better than the two proposed new models at the critical point. But here, what we wanted to see is whether those results were being driven by a few intrinsic network, intrinsic networks, or is it something that is generalizable across all of them? So what you're seeing here is the distribution of memory capacity for the three dynamical regimes, stable, critical, and chaotic, uh, for the seven intrinsic networks. 
again, we co we're comparing this against the reward new uh, model and the label permutation model. And the important observation here is that at the critical point, um, empirical intrinsic networks uh, outperform these two new models. So meaning that the results that we saw before are not being driven by a few intrinsic networks, but it's rather something that is generalizable across, across the connectome. Now, uh, we're not only interesting, interested in comparing the empirical networks uh, against the two new models, but we would also like to compare, to see how intrinsic networks compare to each other uh, in terms of memory capacity. However, that comparison results a bit challenging because we know that memory capacity depends on trivial factors such as the number of nodes within each intrinsic network. And it also depends on the number of um, connections within each. I think there is a question. Yeah, um, Cindy Garcia uh, was wondering, could you repeat um, what memory capacity is? Yes. So conceptually speaking, memory capacity is the ability of the network to retain in its current activation state information about past inputs. That's uh, conceptually speaking. Mathematically, is the, we define it as the sum of the correlations across delays. So that's what we're, right. OK. So, so yeah, so as I was saying, we would like to compare intrinsic networks um, uh, between each other, but this comparison results a bit uh, challenging because memory capacity depends on trivial factors such as the number of nodes or, or the number of internal connections within each intrinsic net network, which are like a proxy for the amount of positive feedback. So in order to compare intrinsic networks above and beyond these uh, trivial factors, we normalize our estimates by uh, relative density, which, we which is defined as the ratio of the number of internal connections to the total number of possible connections. And the total number of possible connections is given by this expression where n corresponds to the number of nodes within each intrinsic network. So these are the memory capacity estimates for each of the seven intrinsic networks for the three dynamical regimes without normalizing by relative density. And this is when we uh, normalize by relative density. So there are three observations uh, here. So the first one is if we look at the critical regime, we, we can see that there's not much difference in terms of memory capacity across intrinsic networks. However, this network here, which is the limbic network, uh, presents the highest memory capacity. And this result is interesting because traditionally the limbic network has been um, linked to memory encoding processes. So this result kind of suggests that um, there might be an anatomically mediated predisposition of the limbic network to participate in these uh, memory encoding processes. The second point is um, if we look at the stable and the chaotic regimes, we can see that the intrinsic network networks present uh, an opposite ordering, meaning that those that perform better in the stable regime perform um, uh, worse in the chaotic regime. So again, we see like an interaction between network topology and, the, and dynamics, in this case, to confer certain functional flexibility to these intrinsic networks. And the third point has to do with this idea of the existence of a global gradient in cortical um, in human cortical organization. So this global gradient, which spans from primary sensory areas to transmodal areas, um, it's a, an axis of variation for different cortical features, including microstructure, functional connectivity, gene expression, um, etc. And in line with this idea of um, a global gradient, this uh, work by Daniel Margulis and colleagues, they show that the main axis of variability in functional connectivity tracks a functional hierarchy that goes from primary sensory processing to higher order cognitive functions. So based on that, if we look at the, at the like axis along which our memory capacity estimates, it broadly resembles that unimodal transmodal uh, hierarchy, differentiating uh, sensory 
networks such as the visual and somatomotor motor from um, association networks such as frontal parietal and the default mode. So these results suggest that there might be a potential link between the hierarchical organization of the cortex and its, um, in this case, memory capacity. Okay, so going to the next section, um, here, what we did is, well, before maybe I continue, just want to make sure if there are any questions. Maybe there is one. Yeah. Dude, oh, so Cindy was asking again, um, so how do you interpret the variability in the performance at critical states in the default mode network? You mean this variability here? <laughs> um, yeah, to be honest, I haven't thought about it. <laughs> but because um, there's actually these other two other networks, the somatomotor and the ventral attention. Um, but to be honest, I. Hmm. Yeah, I don't have an answer for that question right now. Let me think about it. Okay. I was, yeah. Um, I was wondering, I guess, to make sure I understood, you know, when you, so your reservoir is constrained by the structural connectome. And then when you were, you were basically comparing um, that the performance of the constrained one to a reservoir that's like trained with your data. So that's like the null reservoir or like, or do you, do you ever, or are you not, do you have to train like the weights of the RNN prior to using the model? Like, is that necessary or can you not do that? No. I start, uh, do you have to predetermine the weights of the reservoir? So that was my question. Yeah. So, so, um, so, the, what we did is we basically took the weights of the human connectome, the ones that we obtained from the MRI data and the tractography algorithm, and we plugged them in the reservoir. So those weights are fixed. They are not changing. The only weights that we train are the ones that go from the reservoir to the readout unit, which are equivalent to the coefficients of the linear model. Now, the other thing that we did is because we wanted to test whether the network topology, uh, whether the memory capacity depends on the underlying network topology, what we did is we rewired the network, meaning that we destroyed the topology and then we compare that against the human connectome. So that's the first new model. And the second new model, the idea was to see like we have these intrinsic networks which divide the cortex into these seven subnetworks. We wanted to see if what happens if we randomize those. In, so instead of taking the visual and the default mode, what if we randomly take nodes and see how they perform? So we keep the same network structure. We're just changing the modular structure of the connectome in a way. And then we see that when we destroy that modular structure, uh, the human connectome performs better at the critical point. So meaning that, OK, the, the modular organization of the connectome in these intrinsic networks actually provides certain computational advantages. So those are the two new models that we, that we used. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for the question. OK. Okay, so in, in this next sec, uh, section, what we did is we wanted to see how information is being transformed as it travels through each of these intrinsic networks, meaning how the information that leaves the network is different from the information that goes into the network, or in other words, how different the information sent by the network uh, is from the information received by the network. So that's what we call um, the encoding and decoding memory capacities. So to uh, further explain these two concepts, let's think of the human connectome as a network of these subnetworks. Uh, this diagram does not represent um, the actual connectivity, it's just to uh, e e explain the concept. So let's say we want to focus on the dorsal attention network. So if we want to 
uh, estimate the encoding capacity of, of the dorsal attention network, then we're going to do that based on the information sent by the network. So in that case, we're going to use as output nodes the nodes that correspond to the dorsal attention network, because that 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 is used as a proxy for the information sent by the network. If we want to estimate the decoding capacity of the dorsal attention network, then we're going to do that based on the information received by the network. So in that case, we're going to use as output nodes the nodes that are direct neighbors to the dorsal attention network. So that would be as a proxy for the information received by the network. So. Um, so again, for the seven intrinsic networks, we estimated the enco their encoding and decoding um, memory capacities, and then we uh, found the difference of the two. Uh, so what the results that I'm going to show you in the next slide actually correspond to uh, an effect size known as the coins D estimator. Um, for a pair sample t-test under the new hypothesis that the mean of the difference between encoding and decoding is equal to zero uh, versus the alternative hypothesis that that difference is different from zero. Um, yeah, so I'm going to show you the results. So we did that for every value of alpha, but then again, we are summarizing um, across each of the three dynamical regimes. So I'm going to show the, the results for for each of the three dynamical regimes. So we have a stable, critical, and chaotic. So there are three observations here. The first one has to do with the sign of the difference between encoding and decoding. So um, a positive difference between encoding and decoding means that a particular intrinsic network performs better as an encoder. And um, a negative difference means that a particular intrinsic network performs better as a decoder. So based on the sign, we can see that those networks that perform better as decoders in the stable regime actually perform better as encoders in the chaotic regime. So again, it, there is like this interaction between network structure and dynamics, again, to confer certain functional flexibility to these intrinsic networks. The second observation has to do with the magnitude of the difference. So a large difference between encoding and decoding suggests that there is um, certain heterogeneity uh, or implies that is it, um, heterogeneity in the information content across uh, intrinsic networks, which suggests that there is a segregation of the information across the connectome. Whereas a small difference between encoding and decoding implies that there is certain homogenization of the information across intrinsic networks, suggesting that there is an um, integration of the information. So if we focus on the magnitude of the difference, we can see that at the critical point, these, the difference is much smaller compared to the stable and the chaotic regimes. So again, uh, so meaning that at the critical point, there seems to be an integration of the information, whereas in the other two dynamical regimes, there, there is certain segregation of the information. So again, there is this interaction between network topology and dynamics. And in this case, to negotiate that trade-off between segregation and integration of the information across the network. And the last point uh, has to do when um, we compare the human connectome against the two proposed new models. So if we compare the human connectome in terms of the magnitude uh, of the difference between encoding and decoding, we can see that this magnitude, um, it's higher for the human connectome, is significantly higher for the human connectome across intrinsic networks and across the three dynamical regimes, um, suggesting that the human connectome promotes uh, regional heterogeneity of the information content, and thus it supports uh, functional specialization. Okay, and the, the last thing that we did was there is a there has been like a common um, uh, a recurring theme throughout the, the the talk, and is this interaction between network topology and dynamics. 
So what we did here is we perform a correlation analysis in which we correlated local and global topological properties of the connectome with our memory capacity estimates. So on the local side, we analyze node strength, clustering coefficient, node between a centrality, um, participation coefficient. And on the global side, we studied the characteristic path length of the network, transitivity, and modularity. Again, we performed these for the three uh, dynamical regimes separately. So, okay, so on the local side, because we're talking about local properties, each node in the network has a value. So, instead, so in this case, we're going to have a correlation for each of the 1000 group consensus networks. So this distribution of correlations correspond to the, to the distribution of the correlation between memory capacity and node strength across the 1000 group consensus networks. On the global side, because we have a single value per um, network property, we only have a correlation across the 1000 group consensus uh, networks. So, Again, we perform these correlations for the three dynamical regimes. And there are three things that I want you to notice here. So the first one is that if we look at the magnitude of those correlations, they are from moderate to high, suggesting that there is an influence of network topology on, uh, on the performance of the connectome. The second point is that the direction of that influence depends on the dynamical regime. So this the design of these correlations uh, uh, shifts from, from one regime to the other, meaning again that it is not like network topology drives dynamics and dynamics drives performance, but rather network topology and dynamics interact to drive performance. Um, and the last point is that uh, the correlation between uh, network properties and memory capacity seems to be uh, smaller at the critical point compared to the stable and the chaotic regimes, meaning that at this uh, at criticality, the memory capacity of the connectome is much less dependent on network topology and seems to depend more on global network dynamics. Okay, so to summarize um, what we saw throughout the talk. So first, the computational advantages granted by the underlying macroscale uh, just going to move this because I cannot see. Uh, granted by the underlying macroscale network topology of the connectome and its mesoscale modular organization are optimized in the context of critical dynamics. The modular organization of the brain in functional systems, as defined by this intrinsic network, constitutes a computationally relevant feature of the human connectome. The connectome's network topology optimizes the trade-off between computational capacity and metabolic costs uh, derived from wiring. It also supports functional specialization by promoting a spatial heterogeneity of temporal information content across functional networks. Uh, throughout, we observe a prominent interaction between network structure and dynamics such that the same underlying architecture can support a wide range of learning capacities across um, the three dynamical regimes. And finally, uh, I, would, I would say that besides uh, the novelty of the methods, the main innovation of this work lies on the shift from a phenomenological concept of function understood as functional connectivity towards one uh, that is more focused on the information processing properties of the brain. Uh, so with that, I want to thank you all for listening and also my supervisor, Dr. Bratislav Misic and my co-supervisor, Dr. Guillaume Lajoie. And thank you um, to my lab members. I'm happy to take uh, any, any questions. Yeah, my love. <laughs> Hi, wonderful talk. I mean, such a thorough piece of work, and, and thanks so much for presenting with us today. Can you can you talk a little bit more about the choice of using um, uh, the it was the emotional network as a, as kind of like a positive control because.
in the context of memory that you described before, you would you would imagine that past states of kind of that network would be predictive of future ones. Is that a pretty fair assessment? So could you maybe give some more insight of, into that, into that choice? But uh, the choice of, of what, sorry, I, I did not. Of... So you use, uh, use um, I forget what you called it, but you had a positive control network basically, right? So you have, you basically had, or a, a control network, right? So can, yeah. can, you, can you, can you give us some insight into that choice? Because that, that part wasn't particularly intuitive to me. Okay, so so okay, when you talk about the the positive control, are you referring to the rewired networks, or? Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, you, you used it throughout, right? I mean, you used it throughout as a comparison network, right? Yes. Um, yeah. So, so maybe just some intuition on on that choice instead of you know a canonical DMN or canonical resting state network, right? Because you do you, you had it as a comparison to those other networks. Or if I missed the point entirely. Yeah. So, um, so like, so we have our our um, empirical networks, which are which is the the human connectome, and we have the the actual intrinsic networks as uh, for the definition of the of the output nodes. So, and then we're comparing that with two other things. So the first one is we take the human connectome and we destroy the topology. And we did that to see, um, to see if the actual topology of the network uh, um, provides any computational advantages. Meaning, is it that the human connectome is better than random networks or is the same? So that was the first kind of control that we did. The second control has to do more with the modular organization of the connectome in these seven intrinsic networks. So for that, we compared that against uh, randomly selected intrinsic networks. So, so instead of taking visual as visual, what we did is we, we permuted the labels uh, across the across the brain, and then we use those random uh, networks to compare them against the, the the empirical intrinsic networks. So, meaning, like, is it is it the same performance when you use the visual as a network and the default mode and the somatomotor? Does it have any computational advantage, or is it the same when we take a random set of nodes? Um, in the, in, the, in the human connectome. So what we actually saw is that when we use those intrinsic networks as functional modules, the performance at the critical point is actually um, superior compared to the random intrinsic networks. Yeah. Thank you. Is, is it? OK. I hope it's more clear. Yeah. Um, are there any other questions? Cindy? Yeah, hi. Hi, um, Cindy. Um, I, I don't, I'm not sure if this is a valid question because I don't understand really like a lot about the, the memory capacity uh, concept. Mm -hmm. But when you use um, alpha values for, to induce like a um, chaotic states, Mm -hmm. Are those coding states actually something that we can find in empirical uh, networks in, for example, um, disease states or just it's just theory? Um, that's a really good question. So what I know from the neuroscience literature is that most people, or, or there, there are several empirical studies that have shown that the brain operates more like at a critical state than rather than a stable or chaotic dynamics. But um, um, but it's still uh, but yeah, I don't know if it's um, I don't know if I, there have been studies showing that chaotic dynamics are maybe related to disease states. Um, I'm not sure about that. 
but it's a good question like if if chaos is like uh, it's biologically plausible my guess is that usually chaos uh, appears in very uh, in nonlinear dynamical systems and the brain is highly nonlinear so but but it's a good question yeah for which i do not have a concrete answer <laughs> yeah Yeah, I think there is a question in the chat. So it's from Ting. It says, thank you for your great presentation. Thank you. <laughs> I was wondering how can you do the relationship between network metrics and memory using group consensus network? Because the network is just um, represents the average network of group level, not individual networks, which means that you just get one value for one metric that is example, global efficiency. Um, yeah, so the reason why we use um, these group consensus networks is because we're, we're not interested in seeing, I mean, we could do the other way around in using individual networks and it would actually be an interesting question in seeing how differences in network topology across individuals would translate into uh, differences in memory capacity. But what we wanted to to do here is more like we, we want to capture we wanted to capture those uh, connections that are um, consistent across various individuals and to use that as a representation of the human connectome. So that's why we did it that way. And the other question is, could you give a little bit detail about the group consensus network? Yeah. So the way in which we um, we build those group level networks is we um, we build a distribution for the value for each of the connections. We have a distribution across individuals, and then we shows uh the, the the way in which we chose those the existent connections in the final group level uh consensus network was by if the distribution crosses zero then uh we would not include that connection in the group uh consensus matrix um and the other thing that uh that meth the method that we use uh takes into account is that it tries to reproduce um group consensus networks that have the same connection length distribution as the individual um, connectivity networks. So that's how we, we decided on which connections appear in the group consensus uh, network level, um, in the group level network. And, um, and for the values, like for the for the values of the connections themselves, what we did is that for those connections that um, appear in the final uh, group level network, we average across across the the subjects. That's how we build those consensus networks. If you want more details, the um, the method that we used, I'm not sure if I. Yeah, it's um. It's in this uh, paper by Richard Petzl. Um, but yeah. I don't know if there are other questions. Um, if not, I guess um, we could move into the student discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Malar. Very creative work. 